dive in my official introduction, I just want to say I always encourage classes to dance before in the countdown bit. There's a student of Ms. Arcan's class that just spun around the entire 30 seconds. I have no idea how you're not falling off the chair right now, but that was amazing. So thank you for that. Uh, my name is Jesse, everyone. I'm your virtual adventure guide here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And I know we've got some amazing familiar faces in the crowd. Some of you have joined us for tons of programs this year, which is awesome. But if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And today we continue part two of our epic five-part series, which is the Early Career Ocean Professional Series in conjunction with the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition and for Ocean Week Canada. So I'll bring up all these links for you as we're talking about this, but if you want to check out our full series of programs this week, this is the link you can check out below. We are featuring some of the coolest explorers, scientists, conservationists, communicators from around Canada and beyond to share stories of what it's like to be an early career ocean professional. Uh, ocean Week Canada is something that we've been partnering with for several years now. There are hundreds of events happening coast to coast to coast. In fact, tomorrow I leave for St. John's to be part of a conference as one of the kickoff events of this whole extravaganza, but I'm really excited to get to spend the day with you today as we continue with this series. Yesterday we hung out with Amelia Nimmin live in BC talking about marine plankton and bio blitzes, one of my very favorite topics. And today we're hanging out with Someone I've been doing stuff with for a very long time now in a variety of ways, and that is Sam Macbeth. And she has a, a lifetime of experience doing some very cool stuff in and on the water. But particularly today, she's going to talk to us about polar life uh, at the north, south, uh, Arctic, Antarctic, and beyond. She is a polar guide. She has one of the coolest jobs in the entire world to get to bring people out and show them some of the most incredible places on planet Earth. So we're going to get a chance to hear from her today. I'm so excited for your questions. And without further ado, I will stop talking finally and turn it over to Sam. Sam, thanks so much for joining us today in Halifax. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jesse. I'm so glad to be, um, you know, on the stage again. It's always such a blast, and I always have such fun with the classrooms. So, hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for tuning in, and I'm really looking forward to sharing some stories and um, just answering your questions because part of what this series is all about is how there's some a lot of really cool jobs that allows you to share your passion for the ocean, get involved with the ocean. Um, and that doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, fishermen or anything like that, though, if you want to, that's a fantastic career as well. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about my job. Um, and I hope this sparks some interests. So without further ado, I've got lots of great photos for you guys. Um, and I'm excited to share you share them. So um, I want to talk to you guys about cold water life, my cold water life, because, you know, I, I live in Canada, but I'm not necessarily, you know, right in the Arctic and right in Antarctica, but I've always loved being in cold water, around cold water, and seeing all that life around cold water. So a little tiny bit about me. Um, I'm Canadian. I grew up in Quebec. Uh, but I'm currently talking to you guys from Nova Scotia. I'm in Chibuktuk, Halifax. Um, I have a bachelor's of biology from the University of Quebec in Montreal, Lucas. So I studied in French initially. Um, and then I got a master's a little bit later um, in at Carleton University in Ottawa, studying something that was specifically Northern focused. I did a project, a, a program called Northern Studies. I've been going up and working in the Arctic since 2014, but I've been working as a professional polar guide since 2018. So I like to wear a lot of hats right here. I've got a toucan with some goggles, but, you know, all sorts of different hats in this job. Um, I like to spend a lot of time in cold remote areas, either doing science or showing people how amazing these places are. So here's a few action shots of me doing field work. So I, I do a lot of a botany. So looking at plants and looking at what is living in the tundra. Um, and on the right there, you see I'm actually pressing plants. Um, and that's another pretty arid location. But I don't really want to talk to you guys about my science job, though it's a lot of fun. I want to talk to you guys about my other gig. And here's a different hat this time. So I work as a polar expedition guide, which means that I get to bring all sorts of people. And these are people who are, are tourists. These are people who are, are, are either doing research projects. These are people who are interested in learning more and experiencing some of the most remote places in the world. That is the Arctic and Antarctica. 
So what does that look like? Well, here's a photo of me guiding a group of people on land. So we're doing a hike. Um, and this is in the Arctic. This is a beachy island, very, very barren, really interesting historic site. Uh, but it also means doing something that I love very, very much, which is drive really fast. There we go, because that is how you get around in both polar regions. Um, you know, the best way to get to different locations around here, there's no roads, right? And flying around would be very difficult. So we go by boat and we use these rubber boats that you can see here. And here's another photo of one right here. We use these rubber boats called Zodiacs. So they're inflatable. They have a rigid bottom and then offboard motor. And these allow us to get up close and personal with all sorts of wildlife. So here's a fur seal. And as you can see, I'm standing in the back driving the Zodiac and everyone else is enjoying getting a good smell of this guy because they're quite musky. Um, and you know, you're in their home. So Zodiacs allow you to approach you, approach them, uh, approach the animals in a way that it doesn't disturb them too much. If you do it gently without like rushing in, like I was doing earlier. So you get to go see the wildlife. But sometimes the wildlife likes to come and see you too. Hello. Ooh. Hello, Minky Whale. Hi. <laughs> so we definitely got a good blow. I'll show you guys that again. Where's the minky? There it is. Hello. Ooh, big minky breath. Uh, we like to call them stinky minkies because they do have really stinky fishy breath. And when you you get a blow that of that right in your face, it's a little oily, actually, I have to say. So um, I guess, you know, there's no there's no teeth in their blowhole. So I guess you can't really brush your brush your blowhole. Um, anyway, so here's another bit of how we were able to approach the wildlife. This is a shot of us with in the Zodiac. And then you can see the adventure ship that we use. So these are, you know, small cruise ships. They're ice rated so they can move through I, um, sea ice. And there's about maybe, I'd say about 100 tourists, 100 passengers that are here to see the wildlife and maybe about 20 guides and a whole crew running that ship of about 50 officers and sailors. So, uh, you know, quite a lot of people on that ship, little, little floating villages that really allow you to get in the most magical of places. And when you get off those, that ship, this is how you get in, in and out of a Zodiac. So it's quite adventurous, even this aspect, just being able to get in and out of these locations to go visit. So I work in both polar regions. So if you're not familiar of where exactly they are, the Arctic is in the north. It's on the top. Um, and you can see um, it is actually an ocean surrounded by land and islands, right? Um, and that white part that's growing and shrinking is the seasonal variation of that sea ice. And you've got Canada there and you've got Russia on the other side. And you've got Greenland looking like a big white island. And then on the other side of the world, in the South Pole, on, underneath a globe, if you were to hold a globe in your hand, you have Antarctica. And Erica is actually the opposite. Instead of being an ocean surrounded by land, it's a great big landmass surrounded by a frigid ocean. And when people think of the colors of the polar regions, you often think of ice and snow and mountains, right? So you tend to see it kind of in these shades of gray and black and white and maybe Dark, you know, blue for the sky and dark blue for the ocean. Even the animals themselves in the Arctic and Antarctica tend to follow those colors as well. They tend to be pretty black and white and brown, uh, maybe with a touch of color here and there. We've got some penguins. We've got an Arctic fox, a polar bear, a caribou, um, a gilmont, a black gilmont there. But I also like to tell people that these polar regions are also surprisingly colorful. So here are some bird cliffs that are covered in bright sunburst lichen. So that's the yellow. And this is not a, this is not a saturated photo. This is a, a real photo of, of cliffs um, up in Greenland, uh, up in the Arctic. 
So you have all that colorful lichen on the rocks and you have flowers blooming. There's fireweed, there's harbell. And what is bringing all sorts of nutrients on those cliffs are the birds. So birds are nesting up there and all the food that they eat in the ocean, well, they got to poop it out somewhere and they tend to poop it out where they roost. And that is yum, yum nutrients for all the plants living on these cliffs. If you're in the Arctic in the summer, it's also surprisingly green. Here's a photo I took up in Labrador. And all of that tundra, it's quite wet and it's full of very lush vegetation. And if you crawl on your belly, you can get nice and close and you can see all that variety of life that is right flush at the bottom like a carpet. Life is still pretty hard in the polar regions. It's very, very, very windy right? The winds are quite strong. So a lot of plants can't grow very tall or they tend to get blown away. Um, the ground is frozen all the time. You can see that photo of that dirt that's been dug up and all that underneath that dirt is frozen and it's called permafrost. So it's frozen all year round. And despite how much ice and snow that I've been showing you guys, functionally, the Arctic and Antarctica are deserts. That's because the water is locked up in that ice or in that snow, and you can't drink snow. You might have tried before, and actually putting snow in your mouth will dehydrate you and make you cold because you're using your body's energy um, to melt that snow to make it drinkable. Um, so functionally, everything that lives there needs to be able to tolerate the cold, the wind, the dryness. So it could look beautiful, but very barren, right? Um, so that means that actually most life doesn't really occur on land in both the Arctic and Antarctica, especially for Antarctica itself, because it's much more barren, you know, but life finds a way of living in these areas. And why is that? Well, that's because life in cold waters is absolutely teeming with food, with energy. There is a lot more in cold water, cold oceans, than there is in hot water and hot oceans, which seems surprising because we always think of the tropics as you know, coral reefs and incredible areas with colorful fish. But there's a lot more life you know, in a glass of water that you'd take in Antarctica than a glass of water that you'd take in the Caribbean. And that's why we say that every second breath that you take, if you take one breath right now and out, and then that second breath, well, every second breath that you take comes from the ocean, doesn't come from the trees on land. And this Bowhead whale is taking a deep breath out near Clyde River in Isabella Bay. And that's because there's a lot of life in the cold waters in both polar regions around the, in the Southern Ocean and in the Arctic Ocean. And that little green life is called plankton. So there's algae, there's all sorts of little microscopic life that is taking CO2 out of the air and releasing oxygen so that it can grow and it can bloom. And that plankton that you will find in the surface of the water also embeds itself underneath that sea ice that I showed you earlier. So it's able to use the little holes, a little speckling in that sea ice to survive, to cling on. And the sea ice is actually thin enough. You know, it's not full light, but it's thin enough that sunlight actually can go through that snowy part and, you know, feed the growing plankton, the growing microscopic plank life. All that green stuff, all that plankton, those diatoms, that micro, those micro plants feed zooplankton, all sorts of microscopic animals um, that live all over the water column, but are very much associated with that sea ice that you saw because that's where all the plankton is, right? The phytoplankton. These guys are going to be food for all sorts of life. So this is an ice cod. He's hiding in the sea ice there. All sorts of other creatures, some 
weirder looking than others, right? Some that you might be familiar with. We've got fish and star sea stars and urchins and seals. It's a great big circle of life directly linked to how cold that water is and attached to the sea ice. And if you have a lot of some of this small zooplankton, those small animals like these guys, krill, if you get lots and lots and lots of them, well, you can feed some of the biggest animals or actually the very biggest animal that we have on planet Earth, the blue whale. Isn't it funny that the biggest animal in the world eats one of the smallest one? But I think the way you look at it is that they're not, blue whales aren't eating krill one piece at a time. They're eating them by the massive mouthful. So krill is like a bowl of rice. So you'll have each individual grain is a krill, but you won't eat a single grain of rice. You'll eat a whole bowl. bowl. And that's how blue whales do it. Another big predator that you can find in the polar region, specifically just in the Arctic, is this guy. Can you spot him? Not in the middle. That's a seagull. What's up there on that ice shelf? It's a polar bear. So polar bears are actually, you know, pretty much a marine animal. They live most of their life dependent on sea ice and they're incredible swimmers. So in the Arctic, you can see them fishing, hunting on the sea ice and migrating through the landscape. Now, there are a lot of similarities, like I showed you, between both polar regions, right? There are areas that are cold water, difficult to live in, quite des like quite desert-like, despite all the snow and ice. And growing things depend on that sea ice and, be, and are at the bottom of the food chain and feed everything else. But there are some pretty big differences between both regions, right? When I bring people to Antarctica, to the south, there's something quite exciting that they're happy to go and walk on the landscape to see because there's actually very little life on land in Antarctica. Most creatures go on land to have their babies and then they'll go back to the ocean when they're done taking care of their babies. So the first time that I went to Antarctica, I imagine what I, you could imagine what I was really excited to see. Right, this is my face the very first time I set foot in Antarctica a few years ago now. And what was I looking for? What was I excited to see? Penguins, of course. My God, penguins are cute. They also, incidentally, smell very, very, very bad. But they're, you know, you get used to it. It's like, a, it's any, like any bird colony. Um, they smell quite fishy and oily, but they're pretty darn cute, right? Um, and we've got two different species here. We've got a chin strap that's, you know, singing the song of his people. And then we've got two baby uh, gentoo penguins, one between my legs and one on the beach there with the zodiac in the background. But what's really impressive with these birds, right? You see them individually. Well, they will roost by the millions on these beaches, right? They have no predators. They have nothing to fear. And they live in groups like this for protection and to keep warm. So you have the adults that are look beautiful with their silver backs and orange head. And then you have the chicks. These are rather older chicks. They're pretty almost teenagers at this point. But they kind of look like Muppets, you know, Kiwis. So they're all brown and fluffy. And those chicks aren't able to go to the ocean yet. They're not waterproof. So they depend on their parents going out to sea to fish and then come back to feed them. Now, it sounds odd, like how do you find your baby when there's millions of penguins? But it's all by call. Every individual parent and every individual chick has their own personal sound that they make. And that's how they find each other. So you can imagine that these colonies with millions of birds in them are also very, very, very noisy. It's like being in a loud crowd. If the chicks are all alone and waiting for the parents to come back, they sometimes get up to trouble and get up to shenanigans. So this is a another beach down in Antarctica. This is in South Georgia. And it's a little bit hard to tell, but there's a thin layer of ice and snow everywhere covering the rocks between the tussock bushes. 
and look what's going to happen. No, no. No, 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 no. Oh. 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 <laughs> don't worry they're fine they're tougher than they look they're quite blubby and fluffy um but you know it's really hard to walk on land for penguins they're basically perfectly adapted for being in the water. Their body is kind of mismatched when they're on land. Their feet are too far back. They're a little bit unbalanced. Their center of gravity is too high. But once they're in the water, watch out. Beautiful, graceful swimmers. And you can see they're using their flippers, their modified wings to swim, and their back feet like rudders. Absolutely beautiful swimmers. And they can swim really, really fast, which means that they can catch fish and squid without much problem. Here's another colony. Now, you might think that a penguins all look the same, but can you see an odd one out? Well, sometimes penguins are born different colors. So this particular penguin in the middle that you can see is leukistic. So he's not an albino. He still has a bit of color and his eyes weren't red. His eyes were blue, but he doesn't seem to be able to develop that silver black color that the other king penguins here have. So he's quite different looking, but beautiful nonetheless. Now, Antarctica might have millions and millions and millions of penguins. Antarctica doesn't have a lot of people though. The only permanent residents, if you wanna call them permanent residents, are the people who live in all their research stations. And Antarctica doesn't belong to any particular country. There are different parts of Antarctica that are administered by different countries around the world, but essentially all of Antarctica is open for science and visitation. It's essentially the world's largest protected area. It doesn't really have that title, but the, the protection treaty that is in place essentially allows Antarctica to be pretty untouched. In the Arctic, well, people have been living in the Arctic since times immemorial, from Russia to Canada, from Greenland to Svalbard uh, to Alaska. There's been people living up there for a long, long time. And despite living with the changing sea ice, they're also incredibly adapted to living up there like the animals are. And I'm, of course, talking about the indigenous peoples of the North, the Inuit, the Dene, the Cree, Greenlanders, Uipik, all across the Arctic Circle. There is over 4 million people that call the Arctic home. And they have a lot of understanding about how the Arctic has been changing and how to best live and thrive in the Arctic. And climate change is definitely bringing a lot of changes to that. I love the title of this book because it really illustrates caribou taste different now, the way that they've been able to sense the changes in every way, not just observing you know, melting ice. The Arctic is a thriving place where people have, you know, a traditional way of life, but also a very modern way of life. They have very quick internet in some of those, these communities up there. Um, and, you know, it's just amazing to be able to have the privilege to visit these communities and to share a little bit in the lives that people lead up in the Arctic. You know, fishing. Did you know that Inuit are the original creators, inventors of the kayak. This is a traditional style kayak. You know, it would have been made with driftwood and bone and sinew and skin. And we got to take them out for a spin. They're very, very tippy <laughs> if you've ever been kayaking before. And you know, that brings me to the final little bit that I wanted to tell you guys. I've been sharing some of these 
beautiful places, these adventures that I've had the privilege to bring people along and to share why I love the Arctic and why I think it's such a beautiful place and Antarctica, why it's such an amazing place. But how does someone start and become a polar guide? Well, I have to say that I wasn't, didn't think that I'd end up in the polar regions doing what I showed you that I do now. I did not grow up in a particularly outdoorsy family. Um, I, you know, had to, you know, learn for myself how to enjoy being outside. You know, here's me, you know, canoeing on a river. That was one of my very first loves was just enjoying being on the water with canoes and, and kayaks and, you know, fishing. Um, and it was, you know, maybe a little bit by joining Girl Guides that I learned how to be outdoors a little bit much. But most of what I've learned about how to be in the polar regions, be out in these remote areas and be able to share, you know, my my learnings with people has been as an adult. I've, you know, took learned how to to be outdoors. I took opportunities. I had a job uh, with Parks Canada once and working with Parks Canada allowed me to visit some national parks and learn from all sorts of different people how to best be outdoors. I also did a bit of a crazy adventure when I was 23 and I signed up to join a sailboat crew. Um, having never been on a sailboat before, I signed up to be on the sailboat for five months. Hopefully I wasn't seasick and gratefully so, because that would have been a very different uh, set of five months. But I took that chance. I had the opportunity. Someone someone asked me if I could join, if I wanted to be uh, the science communicator on board, if I wanted to go wherever the sailboat would go. And I actually did know where that sailboat would go. It could have been really anywhere in the world uh, at the time that I joined the expedition. But we ended up going to the Canadian Arctic. And there she is. That was my home in, in 2014, the Sedna 4. It's five months up in the Arctic. And that was, you know, love at first sight. I decided that, you know, after that trip that I'd continue to go myself and to share these regions with the people that I could, either as a tourist or as I'm doing today right now with you guys. And with that, guys, that brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope you have any questions and I'd love to talk about anything else that I shared today um, or, you know, share more stories. I'm full of stories from these adventures. I uh, thanks so much for listening. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing so many stories and some of the best use of video of anyone in the program in ages. So Sam, if you want to come out of screen share so you can see us again, have a bit of a conversation, go for it with that. All right, here I am. <laughs> you also have the best backdrop in like your room of anyone we've had on in years. So way to go doing total thematically with what you're talking about today. Um, YouTube class, if you guys want to chime in, please do share in the chat. We've got a long time for Q&A today, which is great. Mr. Blasis' class, if you want to unmute your mic, I'll absolutely come to you. I'd love to have you take part. But Mr. Steltman's grade fives, uh, if you guys want to kick us off with a question, come on in and take us away. Hey. Hi. Hi. Hi, my name is Carter, and um, do the krill swim in schools? That's a really good question, Carter. Krill are not very good swimmers. They have, you know, they're 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 a shrimp shape, and they have their their feet that they use to paddle underneath them. Despite the fact that shrimp, uh, sorry, krill specifically, are not very good swimmers, they do school. It's a way to protect themselves, right? They'll be in large groups, and also, strangely enough, they're the animal that does the biggest migration in the world. This, the, oh, this seems like a crazy thing to think. What? Not wilderness beast in, in Africa? Not the you know Arctic turn that goes from one pole to the other? Or not the caribou in the Arctic? Krill, to protect themselves, will, during the day, sink to the bottom of the ocean. And in some places, that's almost four kilometers down. And at night, all of them will rise to the surface to feed because what they're eating is phytoplankton. So the phytoplankton needs to have access to air, needs to have access to the sunlight to be able to bloom and grow. The krill need to eat the phytoplankton, but they're able to take oxygen out of the water. And it's very dangerous because basically they're the, they're, the, they're the chicken nugget. They're the chip of the ocean. Everything eats them. So they go up, they rise, 
and they do this every day. Yeah. Yeah. Thousands of meters as for an animal that's about this big. So they bring, they rise, they rise as schools and they go back down as schools. You are one so, of the yeah. only people in our history to mention the vertical migration. It's one of the coolest things on planet Earth. And it's such a huge part of the planet, too. I mean, the oceans dwarf the land surface of this planet. So there's trillions of animals doing this every day all across the oceans of the world. And it's so, so cool. So thank you for that. Uh, Carter, mm -hmm. great question, man. Um, 6 1, let's head to Oakville. If you guys want to come on in as our can spot, unmute your mic and you're good to go. Hey. Hi, shout out to Mr. Stoutman's class. We, we know them too. Cool. <laughs> All right. So our question is from Shafin. Shafin's going to hurry up over here. Okay. We're going to unmute while they organize themselves for Zach. Shafin's coming. <laughs> from the back of the class, tearing through. Pass yeah, exactly. Us. Run. No, you're there good. Last time. Oh, hey. Stop hey. Um, if penguins have no predators, how does their population of uh, uh, how does their population like get limited? And, like, won't there be like a million of them if they have no predators? And isn't there predators like whales in the ocean? Yeah, mm. cool question. That is a really cool question. And actually, you did catch me on that. I I I, I mentioned that they had no predator, but that wasn't quite true. They have no predators on land when they're an adult because they're quite big. Um, and there's no, in Antarctica, there's no polar bears, there's no wolves, there's no foxes, um, any of these are, you know, minxes, all these like predators that you find in the Arctic that will go in bird colonies and eat the eggs or try to kill the, try to eat the chicks or, or grab a weaker adult. Um, in on land, the chicks, when they're really small, they might get snagged by a predatory seabird that's called a skua. Um, so uh, uh, an Antarctic skua, they're, you know, they, they, they look a little bit like a, they're, you know, they're, they're, they've got a pointy beak. They're a, they're a predatory seabird. So they'll grab a chick and, 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 you know, feed their own chicks with it. So they do have that predator. And that is part of the reason why they're in big groups like that. And especially the chicks when they're, where they're waiting for their parents, they'll crash together because as a group, they're harder to pick off and they'll make noise and they'll slap. Um, their wings are really hard. Like this guy right here next to me is made of wood. This is not a stuffed penguin, um, but um, he's very accurate, quite, quite accurate. An artist buddy made it for me uh, many years ago. Actually, he made it for me when I was doing um, the, the Canadian science fair when I was 14, this is when this, this, this person made me a penguin. I've been into like polar regions for longer than I sometimes realize. Um, but, but it's just something I thought I was cool. But anyway, these are wooden, these are wooden hard, but real penguin wings. And this is a, an Adelie penguin. We see with the white eye ring, pretty much as stiff, pretty much the same level of stiffness, enough to break the wing of a, of a skua if it gets too close. Like, wha -bam! In the water, though, a lot of things are trying to eat penguins. So you have leopard seals, you know, the, the, the big predators, the tigers of the, of the sea ocean. So leopard seals will try to eat them. Orca will try to eat them. There's a, there's a few main predators. So the strategy for penguins is make a lot of babies and then swim far fast away so that you are not in the areas that the seals and orca uh, linger. And the seals and orca will linger next to the colonies because they're trying to catch some of the young penguins that are don't know any better and they'll be an easy meal. So yeah, penguins yeah. do have predators. Though I will say one last thing, there are millions of them. There are so many penguins and we keep discovering new colonies in really remote parts of Antarctica and we're like, oh, there's actually 4 million Adelie penguins on the danger islands. So a good strategy when things are trying to eat you in the ocean is just make, make babies, make lots of babies and hope those babies survive. I really like your whoopam thing. I think that's very indicative of them as a species. And it's nice when people are willing to do the onomatopoeia for animal attacks. Um, <laughs> I will encourage our classes. I did share a YouTube link of leopard seals hunting penguins, which is one of the freakiest things in the ocean. Uh, Frozen Planet 2, a recent BBC series, also has an incredible sequence of king penguins, which are one of the biggest species, and their leopard seal predators. Um, mm -hmm. I knew we were going to get this question, Sam. It's inevitable as the day is long whenever we have a polar program. I have an answer for this too. And it is a deli, which you just mentioned. Do you have a favorite penguin from Sam Mills? What is your favorite penguin? Uh, I, I, you know what? I should have thought that this question was going to come in. And I, 
I I love Adelis a lot. Um, there there's only two species of penguins that live directly on the Antarctic continent. All the other ones are like on on islands around Antarctica. Um, so there's only two. There's the emperor penguin, which you mentioned on Frozen Planet, are, pre are a pretty impressive species because they lay their eggs in the middle of the winter instead of you know the summer where there's no ice and snow on land like the other penguins and they hold their egg with their feet right so the chick is born in the spring instead of being born in the midsummer like the other species so only two species are in Antarctica. you get the big boy you get the big penguin which is the the uh, emperor penguin and then you have the adelis which are this size this is true to size and i quite they're, they're quite cute they're quite football shaped yeah. that being said Every time I'm next to one of them, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, actually, chin straps are my favorite. Or I'll be with some gen so cute with their little red feet and their little red beak. And you're and they're really noisy. They chat, they chitter at you. And they're like, oh, you guys are really great. I love you. And then you'll see all the penguins that have the yellow on their head. Right. The the rock hopper penguins, the macaroni oh, yeah. penguins, the, the royal penguins. And they just look like dapper little gentlemen. And they're just fantastic. <laughs> I must say, I'm really biased against chin strap penguins. I don't know why. They just, they're just, they're, I didn't know they had red feet. So that's pretty cool. So if you're lying with them, you've actually been there, you've been around, and I'll give you that one. But like Adelia, the cute little eye thing, we got the cute or Basically, no matter what your favorite penguin is, you have a good reason for it. We got lots of penguins. I think, so. I think it's eight, 18 species of penguin, 14, 18. One of the I, be, I believe it's 18 now. Uh -huh. um, that being said, we're not discovering brand new species. Like we, you know, like lost world style. We, we go into a cave and like, oh my God, incredible. What's actually happening is through genetics. We're finding that, you know, Rock hopper penguins, there's actually like two varieties. They're northern rock hopper penguins yeah. and southern because they're not breeding with each other. So that's what's causing the fact that there's more bird species uh, in general yep. um, and also penguins. But yeah, cool. 18 species now, if I'm not mistaken. There you go. I'm going to head to uh, Mr. Blas's class, grade one, two, Senator Gibson. They want to know our penguins fast swimmers. And then I will do another round with Mr. Stellman and Ms. Arcan in just a minute. But fast swimmer, Samantha, yes or no? Yes, they're incredibly fast swimmers. Um, Gen 2 penguins, the, the the ones that I mentioned that have a white band on their head um, and red a reddish like lip on their beak, um, they can easily go 30 kilometers an hour, 35 kilometers an hour. That's as fast as a dolphin. Wow. Um, and they, what they do is they're so streamlined, right? They just torpedo through the water and they'll do something that's called porpoising. So they'll jump like this, doop, 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 and they're taking a breath. That's their way of breathing. And then they'll dive down um, and they're very, very, very fast, uh, which is perfect for catching fish and getting away from leopard seals because they're actually faster than leopard seals. So Do you have an automatopoeia for the, the porpoising that you want to share with us? Like if they're like, <laughs> you know? I guess it'd just be splash or it might be like- Splash, hey. it could be splash, I like it's, that. It's, I think it's just splash, uh, they're, they're very smooth. It's not super noisy when they're when they're porpoising. Mm. Um, yeah, so cool. it's just, it's, but it's cool to see them like, Especially when you're on a beach and you're watching the penguins yes. come back from a successful hunt, you just see you you'll see a shape underwater and then oh, up they all oh. come up they all come and then they look, they're round with their wings next to them, and the other cool thing is because they're they're working so hard they're swimming so fast is when they come out of the water, the under part of their wing here is flushed pink. Because you can see that it's white. It, I had the black on the outside and white on the inside. And that's the thing for pretty much all penguin species. Cool. But they have a lot of veins. They have a lot of blood vessels along their wings. So they are they can't sweat. They're covered in a feathery down jacket. Mm -hmm. Even their beak is covered. They have no exposed skin that allows them to release heat if they worked really hard. So what they cool. do is they stretch out their wings and it's all flushed and red. And that blood is releasing heat from their body or else they'll overheat. You, uh, this is all the perspective that only a polar guy could give us, that the pictures don't give an insight to. So thank you for all this. Um, we've got a few more minutes. We're going to do two more questions. Mr. Steltman's class, grade fives, come on back. And Ms. Arcan will wrap up with you guys in just a second. Hey, Burlington. Hi, my name is Ryder. And what is your favorite animal? Favorite animal, no pressure, Sam. No pressure. Well, good question, Ryder. I really love, hmm. I'm a big fan of, oh, I know this is tough. I, I feel like I, I, I'll betray all the other species that I no. work with. You know what? They're not in the broadcast. They're not, They're not in the broadcast. You're very correct. Yeah. I think, yeah. okay, so don't tell the other seabirds, but I think it might be albatross is my favorite animal. Uh, the, the wandering albatross. 
incredible bird, you know, beautiful, graceful, massive wingspan, right? Like almost, you know, 11 feet long wings, you know, that's 3.5 meters, just mm. beautiful, graceful. Like I, I, I get a little choked up every time I cross over down to, from Argentina down to Antarctica, we'll, we'll boat over with, with, with our boat. And when you're in that band, when you're in the Southern Ocean, the winds are so strong that it just takes all these big seabirds and they're just living their life, mm. drifting and they're beautiful gorgeous and i can see why sailors had a lot of you know superstitions and myths around around albatross because they're quite magical creatures it's so rare that anyone mentions albatross in any context but i want to encourage our classes when you're done and i'm sure there's a bbc video for this i'll try and find one uh the waved albatross and their mating displays one of my very favorite things in all of nature because it's so elegant and so fantastic and they meet each other after long journeys at sea and it's what they do when they meet that is so special and so cool to see so i encourage you to check that out when you're done mm -hmm. uh Six ones, I'm heading back to you. And then, I, I again, folks, time flies and we're having fun. I will encourage you to check out the rest of our ECOP series. Joe will be hosting the next three in the days to come, all at 12 Eastern, all part of our Ocean Week Canada celebration in conjunction with the amazing folks at the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition. Uh, six one, come on back in for one final question. You are good to go. Okay, go ahead. How do penguins get pregnant? So Mackenzie wants to know how they get pregnant. Ah, oh. oh, yes. Well, Mackenzie. Sorry, Sam, press the wrong button. Something happened on my screen. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, <laughs> I'll right. back. There, there, we there we go. There we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Technology. Uh. So penguins, when they're on land, is to have babies, right? So to have chicks. So obviously, very, very good question, Mackenzie. They're birds, so they lay eggs, um, and so they don't get pregnant. And the way that penguins mate is they'll they'll couple up, right? Most seabirds are like this. It's not just a penguin thing. Most birds that live in the ocean will will find a partner and are usually with the same partner every year and we'll have one chick maybe two depending on the species and the reason why they're loyal and monog monogamous is that raising a chick in these areas is really really hard it's a lot of work so you better work with a partner that knows what they're doing when they're taking care of when they're sitting on the chick keeping it warm and when they're going out to the ocean to find food for that chick and then swapping right because both parents will do both jobs if you're partnered up with a lazy penguin or a really bad flying puffin or a really poor fisherman skua um, or, or uh, petrel, you're not going to be able to raise a chick. It takes too much time, too much resource. It's going to take your whole summer to, to raise that baby. So you're going to find another partner. But if it did work, you're going to find that same partner again year after year. Some of these birds live 70 years and have been with the same partners for as long as the lifespans have permitted that. Cool. So often, how does mating, how do, how do they get together? Well, depending on the species, they'll have mating dance. Jesse mentioned one, right? Albatrosses make beautiful courtship dances. Penguins are a lot like people in, that, in, in one way. They like, they like a shiny rock. And penguins will get, present pebbles to each other because that's how they build their nests. And presenting, a, they'll make a little uh, nest of pebbles. They'll mate. And it's just opening to opening, right? They, they have a little area where the egg comes out, where everything comes out, essentially. And it's called a cloacal kiss. They'll touch. It's not very graceful. It doesn't take very long either. And if it's successful, there'll be an egg. And they'll raise that chick. That was a very elegant and beautiful answer, Sam, for the whole process. <laughs> Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, we could go all day. I know polar topics are one of our most uh, insanely popular things all year long. Uh, we will wrap up the broadcast there, but if you're keen to learn more, Sam does amazing work. We have a ton of polar programs on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Everything we do goes there and stays there forever, so please do check that out. Uh, so much to discover. And again, our ECOP series has a few more things that might feature some polar topics in the days to come. Um, Sam, uh, I want to bring in our 6-1 class, our last one here who had to stick around before lunch, uh, just to say a big thank you and farewell. And if you want to stick with me for a minute after we're done, that would be great too. But Ms. Arcan's class, thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Bye for now, guys. We'll see you all soon. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye, guys.